But let me give you kind of uh, things that have been really impactful to me in my life because I am an entrepreneur. And I come from the high tech world of Silicon Valley. And I have worked all over the world, particularly in developing markets. And if I think of something that would be a really important message for you to take home, it goes back to the early days in Silicon Valley when Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and I would sit around at nighttime and talk about uh, things that they were dreaming about, things where they thought the computer industry would go. And we're going back to the early 1980s. And here's what's really interesting. In all of the conversations we had together, and they were 27 years old, so about the, maybe the age of some of you. They were 27 years old. The, the computer industry as we know it today was uh, just in its earliest days. The microprocessor was just becoming powerful enough to actually build personal computers. Uh, my go good friend Steve Wozniak, who had invented the personal computer, uh, had never been able to afford his own computer. So he would go to the Stanford Library and he would look up the patents of the large mainframe and mini computers and he would design his own computer because he's a genius. He would design it on paper because he couldn't afford to buy the components. There was no such thing as a personal computer. And <coughs> when he created the first Apple II, uh, he did things that had never been done before, but he had curiosity and he had the interest in adapting technology to make it affordable for something that he aspired to. And what I learned from those conversations with Bill Gates and Steve Jobs in the early days, none of us ever talked about making money. It was always about the noble cause. And the noble cause that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and Bill Gates, uh, all of these young entrepreneurs had in those early days was to empower the knowledge worker. The knowledge worker was a term that uh, had been introduced uh, some years earlier, but there wasn't really a knowledge industry uh, when it was first introduced by Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker uh, became the most famous business strategist in the world. And he introduced this idea of a knowledge worker uh, and the concept of the information age uh, almost 20 years earlier than the beginning of the personal computer era. So when he suggested the idea of an information age and a knowledge worker, most people had no idea what he was talking about. But Steve Jobs and Bill Gates did, and they were inspired by it. And so their noble cause was to create uh, a tool for the mind, a computer, that could be the enabler for knowledge workers to become personally productive. And if you look back to the information industry over the last 35 years, every technology company has pretty much followed the same mission of giving knowledge workers better and better tools to increase their personal productivity. Didn't make any difference whether it was Intel making chips, or Microsoft making software, or Cisco making uh, networks, or Apple you know, making its personal computers and other devices. It was always about empowering knowledge workers with better and better tools. The other part of the <coughs> uh, vision that Steve Jobs and Bill Gates had as their noble cause was that they wanted to create something that was affordable for people. And so Bill Gates invented what we know today as shrink wrap software. There was no such thing as shrink wrap software uh, in the earliest days. In fact, all of the profit was made from the hardware and the software was given away for free before personal computers. And the third idea in their noble cause was to change the world 
one person at a time. In Silicon Valley, the first thing we say when someone has made a mistake, we say, so what did you learn? Not, why did you screw up? And there aren't a lot of cultures in the world that say, what did you learn? Rather than, why did you screw up? So <clears throat> what's exciting to me is that I believe that there is already a role model of success that the whole world is looking at here in Nairobi, and that's M-Pesa. Uh, people in the US now are talking about Apple Pay. They're talking about uh, Samsung acquiring another company called Loop Pay. Uh, they're talking about uh, uh, UFC. Uh, they're talking about Beacon, you know, all of these new technologies that are going to be important in payment. But the reality is that M-Pesa is a much larger percentage of the gross domestic product of your economy than any of those new entrants will be of the U.S. economy for probably decades. And so whoever came up with the idea of M-Pesa uh, solved a billion dollar problem. And as I said earlier, you have to have the curiosity of there has to be a better way. What entrepreneurs do, they're the kind of people who look at everything and they absorb things and they uh, are great observers and they're constantly thinking about, you know, isn't there a better way to create a, a better product, a better service as a solution? And and PESA is a perfect example of that. You know, there wasn't a fully developed consumer banking system in Kenya as there are in other countries. And in PESA filled that gap. And it did it incredibly successfully. Now, that doesn't mean that you, one can say, well, gee, there's nothing left to invent. You know, quite the contrary. Uh, what I've learned as an entrepreneur is that when you solve one problem, it only creates a derivative effect of another opportunity. So if you want to create a disruptive business, you've got to be able to connect the dots, often across different domains. Doesn't mean you have to be an expert in all of those domains. Like I said, I have experience in consumer marketing, I have experience in high tech, I have experience in healthcare. But one could start a company in consumer health and maybe only have experience in one of those domains as long as you recruited people on your team who did have experience in those other domains. So the other <coughs> uh, message I would point out to you is that rarely is an entrepreneurial company done by one person. It's bringing together the talents of several people in several different domains. I think you're also an investor in other companies. Uh, what is the chief quality that you look for, either in a company profile, or do you, do you tend to uh, look at the individuals that are involved in the company? And if so, what qualities do you look for? It's always about the people, always. Um, it's amazing how many good ideas uh, people come up with. And yet, uh, with all the good ideas that people come up with, uh, it's also amazing how few really, really successful companies there are. And so if you start to say, well, why is it there are so many good ideas from so many people, and yet there's this much smaller number of really successful entrepreneurial companies, particularly in the high tech space? And, and the answer is, first is it's all about the talent of the uh, founders and, and the leadership team that starts the companies. Uh, and the other is, there's a lot of luck. Uh, ask anybody who's been successful uh, as an entrepreneur in high tech, and they'll tell you uh, they were also not only very hardworking, but they were very lucky. And so timing in life is everything. Uh, I've seen, I'll give you a, a good example. Everyone's heard of Google. Uh, how many of you have heard of Alta Vista and Inc. to me? Well, uh, Inc. to me and Alta Vista actually had most of Google's technology before Google. So why was Google successful and Alta Vista and Inc. to me weren't? They disappeared. Part of the reason is you know, Google had exceptional leadership talent, 
with the two co-founders. Uh, they were fortunate to be able to look at the things that worked with Ink to Me and Alta Vista and see the things that were missing. There is a market power shift as a consequence. And the market power shift is shifting the power from the large incumbent producer companies that have dominated industry after industry in market after market all over the world. The power is shifting to the customers, to the consumers. And why is that? Because customers, consumers are paying more attention to the opinions of other consumers and customers than they are to the incumbent brands and products. And that means that you can start out with nothing. And if you have the right idea, let's say it's Snapchat, or it's Instagram, or it's Facebook, or it's Twitter, you know, or it's LinkedIn. Start out with just an idea. And if other people start telling their friends virtually over social media about it, and they promote it, and it goes on and on, these businesses go from nothing to something. WhatsApp, when it was sold, was less than five years old. It had 560 million users and only 56 employees in the company. And that's a perfect example of customers becoming empowered and telling other customers about it. That's the big idea. So what is M-Pesa? Is it a technology? Is it a platform? Uh, is it an infrastructure? Uh, I believe that uh, M-Pesa is uh, in, in many ways uh, not just an app, but it's at the very least a platform. Uh, it may even be an enabler of uh, infrastructures. And it is absolutely um, something I believe will happen. I believe that there will be people who will uh, start to build things on top of M-Pesa. As I said earlier in my general remarks, that solving a problem in, in one era is usually creating an opportunity in the next era. And so you look at M-Pesa and you say, well, what are all the other things that you could do now that people have you know, mobility? I mean, we dream of the mobile wallet in the United States and you've already implemented the mobile wallet. You know, and it's going to expand into more and more areas. It may go into verticals. You know, it may go into agriculture. You know, it, it uh, may go, you know, into health care. It, it can go into a lot of different uh, verticals. So uh, it's just something that may not have happened uh, in the last 10 years at the speed at which uh, you and others would like to see. But I think it's clear that it's going to happen. Somebody's going to do it. And what makes it pretty exciting for you to, all to be here at IHUB is that... Uh, you're probably sitting in the room with someone who's going to do it. There's probably someone in this room who is going to be a successful entrepreneur doing exactly what you described. Why hasn't it happened yet, David? Well, I think we've moved from an era, at least in the States, where women were token uh, board members to where w women uh, have a lot of relevant experience. And more and more, I see companies, and in fact, it's in my book, Moonshot, where I interviewed quite a few women entrepreneurs, um, where there's enough experience and talent out there of women where it's not just a token woman in an organization at the C-level, the, the uh, uh, executive level suite, but um, many women, and in fact many of the women companies have um, a large preponderance of their staff are, are women, and I think that's incredibly healthy. And, and, and today people can work from almost anywhere they are, so it means that women can be able to make the trade-offs between family responsibilities, children responsibilities, and uh, work in ways that just wasn't possible b before we had s smartphones and internet and other technologies. You mentioned it was a lot about luck, but somewhere further down I read about your brothers and one of whom was you know, the CEO at HJ Haynes and the other was a CEO at um, uh, JP Morgan, a private investment, well, I think. Well, one brother was the CEO of uh, JP Morgan Worldwide Private Bank. Uh -huh. And the other brother was CEO of H.J. Heinz USA. Which are both, I mean, all three companies that you've all worked in are number one in their space. What is it about your upbringing or your childhood or <laughs> where you were from? <laughs> I mean, w w what was in the water where you are that led to this kind of success? So we see whether we can get Nairobi City Council to add you to our water <laughs> here as well. Well, we were brought up on a, on a small island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean called Bermuda. 
It was, it's the last of the British colonies. Uh, Hong Kong and Bermuda were the two last. Hong Kong is now part of China, so it's only Bermuda left. And <clears throat> we were brought up in a very simple lifestyle. Um, as a child, uh, we had no refrigerators. We had what was called a wire safe that uh, kept the cockroaches and spiders uh, out. We had a lot of banana trees, so the spiders loved the sweet bananas. Uh, I don't know if you have that here, but yeah, I'm sure you do. And um, we had a goat with goat milk. In the <laughs> it's horrible tasting, but, <laughs> but I like goat cheese. But we, we grew up in, in very simple, clear values. Uh, we were sent away to America to school, so we were sent to a uh, uh, boarding school. I went away at 11. Um, my next brother went away at 9. It was a very British thing to do in, the, in the, those days. And um, we were always brought up with an, a great work ethic. Um, so we were always felt that working hard at something was, imp was important. Our parents died when we were fairly young. So my brothers and I largely looked out for each other and uh, were extremely close uh, to this day. We still work together on, on many, many projects and, and um, you know, even involved in some of the same companies. But I think it all comes down to simple principles of life, you know, uh, hard work, good values, and uh, still a lot of luck. Still, still. And finally, in the end of March, of 1983, uh, Steve and I had spent an entire Sunday together walking around New York, and I was uh, taking him through the Metropolitan Museum of Art and showing him uh, archaic and archaistic uh, sculpture because I knew something about it, and I wanted to see how he would respond to something I knew he knew nothing about, and I knew something about. And then he took me to, he loved music, so he took me to Tower uh, Music, uh, where they were in those days selling uh, music uh, still on eight-track uh, tape, if you ever heard of anything like that. And so we finally ended up at a new apartment he had just acquired at the San Remo Palace on Central Park West. And as the sun was going down and we were standing out on the balcony, um, I turned to Steve and I said, Steve, uh, I really love the friendship we're developing, but I'm not coming to Apple. Uh, I'll advise you for free. I said, uh, it sounds fascinating what, what you're doing, but I think I belong here. And there was this long pause, and there was no one more adept at negotiating than Steve Jobs. Yeah. So you've heard about his skills of performance of selling, his skills of you know, getting people to uh, create great products, but there aren't as many well-known stories publicly as that Steve Jobs the negotiator. And so he stood there and he had his running shoes on like this and, and blue jeans. And in those days he had jet black hair, jet black eyes. I remember he was only 27 years old. And he looked down at his running shoes for the longest time and I'm just standing there. And he's looking there and he's not saying anything at all. And it just seems like it's going on forever. And then finally he looks up at me and we're about that far away from each other. And it's eye to eye. And he says, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? <laughs> or do you want to come with me and change the world? And that's how Steve Jobs recruits and sells. And so uh, having just turned him down, I didn't say yes. But a week later, I was an employee at Apple. <laughs> <laughs>